ادع الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادله بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته look at all the brothers who come inside get close we're about to begin our lesson for tonight Before we begin our talk, Brother Gibran just reminded me to share the good news with the community about our upcoming Umrah program that we have starting on the 26th of November, returning on December 5th. I will lead this Umrah group, inshallah. It's an opportunity for us to go visit the house of Allah again. For those that have not been to Umrah, make dua to Allah that Allah takes you there. And if you have made Umrah, make dua to Allah that Allah allows you to return to his house. And sometimes a shaitan comes to you and tells you that you'll become broke. A shaitan al faqra. Shaitan threatens you with poverty. But the Prophet وسلم, said to us, Tabi'u bain al hajj wal umrah. Continuously do Hajj and Umrah, فَإِنَّهُمَا يَنْفَيَانِ الْفَقْرَ They remove poverty. So this is an opportunity, inshallah. There are flowers everywhere. There's only a few more slots available. And once it's full, you would have to wait until next year. Again, those dates are November 26th to December 5th. Brother Safi, you wanted to get closer? To see us. MashaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa bihi nasta'een min umur al-dunya wa al-deen. وأصلي وأسلم على مبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إلى علمنا يا عليم الحكيم الحمد لله tonight we have a special guest our beloved brother and our sheikh Dr. Farouk Post who's visiting us from Hagerstown, Maryland, about an hour and a half from here. And alhamdulillah, for those who do not know about the Sheikh's background, he studied in the best of all cities, Mecca al Mukarramah in the University of Umbul Khura, where he attained a bachelor's, a master's, and also a PhD. So he's called, that's why he has a DR doctor, he has a PhD in Hadith. He has inspired a lot of us to continue our education until we get the PhD. He has many works of da'wah. He's heavily involved in giving da'wah to non-Muslims and Muslims, different programs, different workshops. So alhamdulillah, it is an honor for us to host him here at PGMA so he may come back to this community once again. As for tonight's talk, MashaAllah, I see some of the young brothers. We need to have more of them here. This Muhadar lecture is for all of us to benefit from. As we see on the title, The Unseen World of Al-Jinn. And we will try to connect that with the festival that many people participate in in the last day of the month of October, which is known as Halloween and how that ties to it. Awalan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with a book that is tibyan li kulli shay. The Qur'an is a clarification for everything. And the Qur'an for us is a guide. Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillatihi aqwam. It guides to what is most correct. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has clarified to us 
what is the correct path and how we continue onto the path and follow the path, the straight path, in which every single day for at least 17 times in a day, we ask our Lord to guide us. Ihdin al-sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us with the straight path. The unseen is al-ghaib. Al-ghaib is the unseen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believers and the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah Azza wa Jalla says Alif Lam Mim Thalika Al-Kitab La Rayba Feeh Hudan Lil Muttaqeen Al-Ladheena Yu'minuna Bil Ghaib When Allah describes the believers Allah says, Alif la meem, thalik al kitab. This is a book. La rayba fi. There's no doubt about it, this book being true. Hudan lil muttaqeen. It is a guidance for the muttaqeen. Who are the muttaqeen, ya Allah? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. Those who believe in the unseen. So part of our faith is to believe in the unseen. So the jinn is a creation from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah mentions in the Quran and the purpose of the jinn we share the same purpose as human beings وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ I did not create the jinn I did not create jinn kind or mankind illa liya'buduni except for they should worship me so the purpose of mankind and jinn kind is to worship Allah and this is the purpose of our creation as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا خَلَقَنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَا خَلَقَنَا السَّمَاءَ We did not create the heavens on the earth and everything in between them بَاطِلًا without a reason ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا This is what the non-believers perceive فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنَ النَّارِ What an evil perception is this Everything has a purpose. What is the purpose of the pen? So we could write. What is the purpose of your car? So you could take you from point A to point B. What is your purpose as a human being? Why are you on earth to worship Allah? So jinn and ins were both created so for them to worship Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the creation, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ The creation of the heavens and the earth is greater than the creation of human beings. So the jinn are a creation of Allah. They're created from a nar smokeless fire and we live in a society that unless we see something we claim that I don't believe in it but that's not true there are many things that we don't see but we believe in okay so if I'm using my phone is there data do you see the data the internet connection do I see it but do I believe there is connection and there's data yes so this is a fallacy to say that I don't believe in something, I'm not gonna, if I don't see it, I will not believe it. This ilm al ghaib only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly knows. Alim al ghaib Fala yudhir ala ghaibi ahada. He is the knower of the unseen. So the jinn, their creation, they live in this earth with us but we cannot see them they're able to see us we're, we're unable to enter their world but sometimes they can enter our world 
So the unseen world of the jinn and sihr magic and witchcraft and black magic. There's no such thing as white magic, by the way. Black magic or good magic, all of it is a sihr. The shayateen disbelieve because they taught people magic. So this is a concept that we see it all the time in our society. But we do not have the, prop, the proper Islamic perspective. And that's why we're having this discussion now. So instead of your children telling you, Daddy, Mommy, do we believe in witches? And do witches have a broom? And this and that. And we have to clarify to the people. Because this Quran is a book that is Kitab al Mubin, it is a clear book. And the message of the Messenger وسلم, is built upon clarity. Taraktukum ala I have left you with clarity. But it is upon us to learn. We have to learn. What did Allah say about this? What did the Prophet وسلم, say about this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a creator. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay, Allah created everything. Ala ya'lamu man khalaqa wa huwa al-latiful khabir. Shouldn't the one who created know? Wa huwa al-latiful khabir. So we need to understand these concepts, teach our children, teach ourselves while we live in this society. We should understand the norms of this society. We should understand the historical context of some of these festivals that is celebrated. So teach your children. Mother's Day is not only once a year, every day is Mother's Day. In Islam, every day is Father's Day. Because Allah wants us to be good to our parents. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah tells us that. Mother's Day, Father's Day is every day in Islam. Not only once a year. Thanksgiving Day, once a year. Every day we give thanks to Allah. So we need to, inshallah, listen carefully and benefit from the speech that will be given by our beloved brother. Dr. Farooq Post, for the Fadl Mashkura Majura. And we'll take question and answer afterwards pertaining to the topic. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi al huda. Allahumma alamna ma infa'una wa infa'una bima alamtana wa zinna ilma. Allahumma inna nas'aluka an taj'al hadha majlis mubarakan. وتجعلنا ممن قال فيهم النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم ما اجتمع قوم في بيت من بيوت الله ويتلون كتاب الله ويتدارسونه فيما بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده Brothers and sisters in Islam, it's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here at PGMA. May Allah Azza wa Jal make this a gathering of benefit for us and for everyone attending this evening. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to place this on the scale of good deeds for all of the organizers of this blessed gathering this evening. At the head of them, my brother, the Imam, Abu Yahya, may Allah preserve him and preserve those around him and his family and increase his status in this world and the next. And may Allah Azza wa Jal bless the admin who helped this gathering to take place and hosted me this evening to have this great discussion about the world of the unseen related to the jinn. So as Imam Abu Yahya mentioned, a little bit, an introduction <clears throat> about the unseen world and how knowledge of the unseen is 
what all of the six pillars of Islam revolve around if we ponder and reflect about them. Related to us. It was different during the time of the companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, and the previous generations. But if we think and ponder about the six pillars of Iman that were mentioned in the very lengthy hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu when the angel Jibreel came to him disguised as a man and asked him, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me about Iman. And he said, Iman is to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the prophets, to believe in the pre-decree, the good of it and the bad of it, and to believe in the day of resurrection. And if we ponder and reflect over these six pillars of faith, all of them are based upon belief in the unseen. Belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. Do we see Allah Azza wa Jal? We cannot see Allah Azza wa Jal in this dunya, but we see signs of Allah's existence throughout the creation within the universe, within ourselves within the heavens, within the earth, within nature, within the stars, within the intricate workings of our nervous system and our muscular and skeletal system in our bodies. Allah, He says, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْسِرُونَ Within yourself there are signs. Don't you see? Don't you realize these signs? So belief in Allah Azza wa Jal is directly related to belief in the unseen. We don't see Allah Azza wa Jal in this dunya, nor can anyone see Allah in this dunya. But we see Allah's signs and we observe them. And that is what made us submit to Allah Azza wa Jal in Islam. Then if we think about the, the second pillar of Iman, belief in the angels. And tukmina bi malaika, to believe in the angels. Do we see the angels? Those magnificent creatures that Allah Azza wa Jal created from light that were roaming the earth and on the earth before Allah created Adam. Do we see angels? Can we see angels? No. If you do see an angel, maybe they came in the form of a man. But how would you know if that is an angel or not? It would have to be from revelation that Allah Azza wa Jal, like in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when in the Hadith of Omar, when the angel Jibreel came disguised as a man, how did the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, know that that was the angel Jibreel? Because Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Prophet Muhammad to some revelation. All the other companions, they didn't know that that was the angel Jibreel. They thought it was just a man who was dusty and right, or he didn't have any dust on him. He wasn't disheveled. He was traveling in the desert and he just came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asking questions. And then at the end of the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what did he say? Atakum Jibreel yu'allimukum dinukum. He said that angel Jibreel came to teach you your religion. So belief in the angels is related to knowledge of the unseen. Belief in the books. We believe in all of the books in their original forms, right? What are the books that Allah Azza wa Jal sent to the previous prophets and messengers? The Torah to Musa alayhi salam. The Zabur to Dawood alayhi salam. Injil to Isa alayhi salam, Suhuf to Ibrahim and Musa alayhi salam, and the Furqan and the Tibyan and the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if we think of all the books that Allah Azza wa Jal sent down, the only one that we witness and observe in its original form to this day is only the Quran. So the Quran is mustathna, is an exception from belief in the unseen of those six pillars in Islam. It's something that we see. But what about the Law al Mahfuz, the preserved tablet in the heavens, where the Quran is preserved, where the angel Jibreel salam, used to descend from the highest heaven and bring the revelation down to the Prophet Muhammad salam, to the lowest heaven and then descend on the Messenger salam, from the Law al Mahfuz? Have anybody ever seen the Law al Mahfuz? No, where the Quran is preserved? No. But the Qur'an is with us, alhamdulillah. This is the only exception of 
the aspects of the belief in the unseen from amongst the books. But have we seen the original Torah in its original form, the way it was revealed to Musa? No. Why? Because you harrifun al kalima an ba'dhamawadihi. Because preserving the Torah was entrusted to Bani Israel. And they broke the covenant with Allah. They chose the dunya, they chose their political agendas to change the word to suit their personal benefits and change the original Torah that was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. Same thing with the Zabur. Same thing with the Injil. Same thing with the Suhuf of Ibrahim alayhi salam. What about the next pillar? The messengers. Belief in the messengers. All of these pillars of Iman are related to belief in the unseen. Have we seen a messenger? No. We are the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but we haven't seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah gather us with him on the day of resurrection. We haven't seen any of the previous prophets, Isa alayhi salam, or Yahya, or Ya'qub, or Musa, or Nuh, or Adam. None of them. But we believe in all of them. And we love all of them. And we respect all of them. And we honor all of them. What about belief in the day of resurrection? Has any of us... Of course we haven't seen the day of resurrection yet. We haven't died yet. Belief in the unseen. Decree we can say, yes, there are some things from decree that we can see. But even if we don't see it, we still have to believe in it. And believe that everything that happens in this dunya was already written in the beginning when Allah Azza wa Jal created everything. And be satisfied with it and pleased with it. So if we really think about these things, subhanAllah, the six pillars of Iman, those articles of faith which we try to nurture ourselves and in our hearts and in our practice to be from not only being Muslims practicing the, practicing the apparent things of Islam, the shahada and the prayer and the zakah and the psalm and the hajj, when we master those things, then the iman becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until we nirtaqi min marhalat aw min manzilat al-muslim ila al-mukmin thumma ila al-muhsin. Nasal Allah an yaj'alana minhum. Yaj'alana min al-muhsinin. So, tonight's topic of discussion, the world of the jinn. Jinn, just the word jinn in itself will tell you, for those of us who understand a little bit of the Arabic language, the meaning of jinn. Jannah, yajinnu, jannun, jannatun, jinnatun, majnunun. Okay, so the word jannah, it means something which is mustatir, something which is not seen, something which is hidden from the eyes. And that's why they call Jannah, right? Jannah. Jannah is also a word used for like a garden. Okay, a garden. Jannatun. Why would they call the gardens or like, you know, the parks that you see a Jannah? Because of the trees and that which, right? The heavy vegetation that covers the light that people can seek shade in. Al-Majnoon, from the same asal, Majnoon. He's Majnoon. What is Majnoon? Crazy, insane. Why is he Majnoon? Because they say it comes from the word Jannah, his aql, his intellect is hidden, or his intellect is covered up by something. Okay? What about... Jinnah or Jannah or Jinn. So the word Jinn comes from that root word in Arabic which means something which is unseen. Something which is hidden from the eyes. And why did Allah Azza wa Jal create these Jinn? Why did Allah Azza wa Jal create angels? Why did Allah Azza wa Jal create human beings? Create animals? Create fish? Create the sun? Create all of these things in existence? As Imam Abu Yahya, he mentioned, 
specifically about the jinn and the human beings. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That the jinn and the humankind, human beings were only created to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Different than other creatures that Allah created. So there are creatures within the universe that we know about and creatures in the universe that we don't know about. Would you guys agree or no? Or do we know about every single creature that Allah created? What does Allah say in the Quran? That He created things which you know and things which you do not know. But as a Muslim, as a Muslim for one who submits, even though we don't know about these things, these creatures that Allah Azza wa created and their tafasil in the details and specifics about them, it's still fundamental and prime that we believe in them. And this, in relation to all of the affairs of the unseen, how if we, if we don't see these things, and the only way that we know and understand about these things is through revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. Knowing the specifics, the characteristics and traits of these creatures, these jinn, can only be known through authentic texts. First and foremost, the Qur'an. And secondly, the authentic hadith of the Messenger Wasallam. Learning about jinn or learning about angels and their characteristics and traits, and in general, the unseen, is not something that you can right, imagine or try to use our weak and deficient intellects to try to imagine or compare these creatures to what we see in cartoons, what we see in posters, what we see in images, sculptures, and things like this. It's very similar to belief in Allah's names and attributes. When Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Himself or describes Himself with certain traits and attributes, we cannot fathom or imagine how Allah's beautiful names and attributes truly are. And nor can we make up new names or characteristics and traits of Allah Azza wa Jal that He didn't name Himself with. So when we talk about the knowledge of the unseen and specifically the jinn, it has to be from texts from the Qur'an or from the authentic hadith. And this is what we need to nurture ourselves constantly with. If somebody says something to you about Islam or about an Islamic ruling or about a legislation or about something halal or haram or this and that, what should your response be? Hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. Bring your evidence if you are truthful. This is what we need to nurture ourselves back into. Attaching ourselves to the nusus. So, when we look in the Qur'an or throughout the sunnah, where do, do we have any texts in the Qur'an that explain how the jinn were created and what they were created from? What are some ayat that you guys can recall about how the jinn were created or what they were created from. That the jinn, the jinn, okay, the plural of jinn, were created from smokeless fire. Smokeless fire. So who was created first? Angels, jinn, human beings, trees, creatures, who was inhabiting and roaming around the earth first? The angels and the jinn. And then Adam salam came on what day? The day of Jummah. So that brings us to, so alhamdulillah, we believe in the jinn. And they are creatures that Allah created that we cannot see. Can jinn inhabit 
other creatures? And then, are there from amongst the jinn, are all jinn evil? Or are there some good jinn? So Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us in Surah Al-Jinn, and many other surahs in the Quran, Allah, He says, there are some from amongst us who have submitted, some from amongst us who are Muslim, and some from amongst us who are just, and then others from amongst us who have different levels of righteousness. Some of us are very righteous, and some of us are less than that. So just how we have amongst human beings, we have believers whose iman is, mashallah, high. Believers whose iman is decreasing. Believers whose iman is very weak. Believers who may be falling into sins. Believers who may be falling into innovations or acts of shirk and things like this. Similarly, we have those creatures from amongst the jinn. Just how we have human beings who are Christian, you have jinn who are Christian. Just how you have human beings who are Buddhist, Jewish, Catholic, atheists, agnostics, whatever you want, similar with the jinn. So what is the Al-Qasim Al-Mushtarak, right? The thing that human beings in jinn share. One thing is Aql, intellect. Second thing, the ability to choose and distinguish between right and wrong. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Quran that He sent messengers to humans and jinn. He sent messengers to human and jinn. And the last messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was sent to everyone, men and jinn. So even the jinn are obligated to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam. So just how you have different categories of human beings, okay, different deens, different religions, different ways of life, different levels of righteousness, similarly you have these creatures from amongst the jinn. Another question or topic related to the jinn which is very important for us to learn, and I mentioned it, can the jinn take over people? Can the jinn enter different creatures? What creatures can they enter? Which creatures can they not enter? The scholars, they mention that the jinn can enter any entity that has a soul. Any entity that has a soul. But there are more, there are creatures which are more likely that jinn enter into them. And that's why many times we find in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right, that he said if you find a snake in your house, right, or near your house, then you should tell it, hey, get out, get out, get out three times. If not, then kill it. Okay? Because it might be a jinn. It might be a jinn who's a Muslim who went inside the snake. It might be a jinn who is a Christian who went inside your dog. It might be a jinn who is a Buddhist who went inside your cow or camel and things like this. So the scholars, they mention that the animals which the jinn are most common to enter are those which are normally looked at as uh, mustaqdar, right? For example, like scorpions, snakes, black dogs, specifically um, other type of animals which are like known to be filthy and disgusting, okay? But they do have the ability to enter human beings, okay? Muslims, non-Muslims, whoever. They do have the ability to enter camels and cows and dogs and cats and any creatures that have a soul. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So, what are some signs that someone may be possessed by a jinn? 
or a creature may be possessed by a jinn. And subhanAllah, I've always said this, that Alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He gave us the means to protect ourselves from jinn and shayateen. Simple things that we can do to protect ourselves, our families, our children, which are practices of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they're very simple. Just saying Bismillah before you eat, while you're eating, before you enter the bathroom. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wa khubthi. Well, khaba'ith. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from Al Khubthi Wal Khaba'ith. Some of the scholars they translate Khubthi Wal Khaba'ith to mean the male and female from amongst the jinn. So that should tell us where the jinn like to hide out, where the jinn like to hang out. They like to hang out in filthy places where people relieve themselves where people answer the call of nature. Garbage, dumpsters, abandoned houses, okay? Basements, open areas, forests, okay? Where it's not inhabited by people. Corners of buildings and rooms and the likes. And specifically around individuals who don't take care of their personal hygiene. And we see many cases of people who may have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, right? Here in the West and all throughout the world. But most of the cases you find here, right? People say, oh, I'm suffering from mental disorder and things like this, schizophrenia or anxiety or nervousness or what they, you know, we would call it waswasa many times, you know, whisperings or things like this. And many times these people, they could be possessed by a jinn but because many of the medical professionals that they go to don't believe in jinn don't believe in demon possession and things like this they only diagnose your physical right ailments oh they'll take your blood pressure oh take this medication try this and that and they don't know they don't have the tools to use to see if this person may be possessed by a jinn and the way that we can detect if somebody has been possessed by a jinn is you need to have a scholar of the deen, a scholar specifically of the Quran, and a scholar who truly fears Allah Azza wa Jal. And unfortunately, in our day and time, Ruqya has turned into a business for many instead of helping and aiding and assisting and trying to cure your brothers and sisters. But we have the cure ourselves. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he do to protect himself from jinn and shayateen before he goes to bed every night? What did he used to do? What did he used to do to his, his grandsons, Al Hassan and Hussein? Every night. We have the protection in our own hands to protect ourselves from jinn. What do you do before? What should you do before you go to bed? As it came in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu would go to his bed, what would he do? He'd put his hands together and he would read the, the three quls Surah Al Ikhlas, Surah Al Falaq, and Surah Al Nas. Three times. Blow in his hands and then wipe it all over his body. Another way to help you protect yourself and prevent yourself from being possessed by jinn or waswasa is sleeping on wudu, having wudu. Sleeping on your right side. When you leave your house, does anybody know any supplication that you should say? 
before you leave your house and that came in the, the hadith specifically that said that the jinn will run away from you? Bismillah. Ha, huh, shabab. You know the dua you say when you leave your house? Bismillah. Red tobe. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. Wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This dua as it came in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when you say this dua and you leave your house okay the jinn the jinn they say to another jinn right first the angels they say wukita wa kufita wa ruqita you have been protected you have been sufficed and you have read something on yourself to protect you or as it came in other narrations as well. You are sufficed when you exit your house, when you leave your house, if you say this dua. So then what will happen when the jinn come to try to put something harmful in your path or distract you or tempt you to go away from something, go away from the masjid. You left your house, you were going to the masjid, but you didn't say this dua, so now the jinn and the shayateen are distracting you. Oh, you should go over there and play soccer. You'll have time to catch the prayer. Or go, go to this restaurant, get a quick bite to eat. You'll have time to go pray and things like this. But when you say this supplication and you leave your house, the jinn are going to say to the other jinn, how can we affect this person, this slave of Allah, who is protected, who is sufficed, and who has read this supplication to provide him self-protection? They won't be able to. So the world of the unseen, brothers, is what makes Islam such a great and magnificent deen. And that's why when we hold steadfast and firm onto our deen and educate ourselves about these things and these concepts of the unseen, no one can defeat us. Because we know when we fight for the sake of Allah, the angels are fighting with us. There may be jinn fighting with us too. So what's the difference now between jinn and demons? Are they the same thing? Or are they different? The scholars, they differ in opinion. Some of the scholars, they say, they say that the jinn are the believing ones from amongst the jinn, the Muslims from amongst those creatures. And they say the demons are the disbelieving ones. So if they were Jews or Christians or Buddhists or Hindus or atheists or whatever they were, whatever category they were from, those who didn't believe in Allah or believe in the Prophet Muhammad then they would be called demons. Just like how people who don't believe in this world, they're called what? Kufar, right? The believers, alhamdulillah, they're all in one category. So that's one uh, opinion uh, from amongst the scholars, okay? Um, what else do we have? Let's take some, we wanna take some questions from, from the floor, inshallah. We've been going for about uh, an hour now, I think, close to an hour. So uh, if any brothers or sisters have any questions, about the topic and uh, one thing that I forgot to mention too is how does this tie in to Halloween? How does this tie in to Halloween? Our discussion tonight about the jinn, about the world of the unseen, how does this tie into our khutbah today and with this upcoming celebration that many people engage in Halloween? Because this celebration of Halloween Halloween comes from All Hallows' Eve, okay? It goes back to a celebration that the ancient Celtic or Celtic Druids used to practice. And they believed that on this night, the night of October 31st, was the night when the barrier between the seen and the unseen was very thin. That on that night, whether how the moon was or how, you know, different positioning in the earth or throughout the season that people would be able to communicate with the dead 
with the jinn, seek aid, seek assistance from them, and the likes of these things. So it was a practice of old times. One of the things that we see, which is very common here in the United States and many you know, other Western countries throughout the world, is trick-or-treating, right? Trick-or-treating, dressing up as, with a costume and then going to people's houses, knocking on their door and asking for candy. Trick-or-treat, trick-or-treat, things like this. Where does this come from? And does this contradict any of the teachings that we have in Islam? First of all, we know that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what did he say? He said, when the, sun's go, when the sun sets, what should you do? You should bring your kids in the house because this is when the shayateen come out and they're more rampant and roaming around. So not only the, the jinn in the shayateen that we don't see, but also the, the shayateen from amongst human beings doing evil, doing bad things. Right? When do majority of criminals do their crimes? At night. Right? There's not much police, not much daylight. They won't be seen by some cameras and things like this. Right? So, also, what are some other mukhalifat of going trick-or-treating? That you're going to people's houses and asking them for food. Begging for food. Begging for candy. Okay? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us about begging and those who go around begging and asking for food and things like that, right? If they're not in need of it, okay? So this should not be something that the Muslim is um, described with or takes part in, trick-or-treating, okay? But the ancient practice where they got this from, where they got this practice of trick-or-treating from was what they used to do, they used to believe that wearing these costumes would disguise themselves from these demons or from these evil jinn so that they couldn't recognize them. And they would go around to people's houses and anybody who didn't give them food, then they would believe that that person was cursed. So many of these practices that we see, right? The jack-o'-lantern. Anybody familiar with the story of the jack-o'-lantern? There's a story behind that. All of these things are based upon Celtic and Druid mythology. Okay? Many of them, they used to go to the graveyard and actually enter into caves underneath the ground on October 31st, seeking things from the dead, seeking things from the jinn and demons and the likes of these things. Okay? And dressing up as costumes, wearing costumes and the likes. So my advice to the Muslim Ummah, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, is Alhamdulillah, naftakhir bi shakhsiyatina. Right? We should be happy and proud of who we are as Muslims. We have the best example within the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the noble companions. Look like a Muslim, act like a Muslim, dress like a Muslim, walk like a Muslim, talk like a Muslim. Why do we want to imitate those people who are worshipping our greatest enemy, the shaitan, in those type of practices? So when we think about all of those practices that are associated with Halloween, you're going to find that all of them are rooted in paganistic, satanic rituals. And I want all of you to go home and look these up. We had some pamphlets out here earlier for Juma. Um, hopefully tomorrow morning, inshallah, I can drop some more off. I'll leave them in the Imam's office for those of you who are interested in reading a little bit more about Halloween and things like this. But um, alhamdulillah. So, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless the community, to protect our elders and protect our youth and enable us to nurture our Iman of the unseen and learn more about these concepts, those related to angels, those related to jinn 
And may Allah Azza wa make it easy for us to learn the proper techniques to protect ourselves from the jinn and from the shayateen and the actions which may lead to pleasing them, which lead to displeasing Allah Azza wa Jal. So Jazakam Allahu Khairan wa Barak Allahu Fikum. Inshallah, I think now we'll give it to uh, Imam Abu Yahya, maybe take some questions from the floor. I know it's late, it's Friday night, 9.30, so I didn't want to make it too long. May Allah bless all of you. Jazakum Allahu Khairan, Mubarak Allah Feek, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May Allah bless Dr. Farooq for his beneficial reminder. Are there any questions from the brothers or the sisters side? Do we have the extra mic somewhere? The brothers, we could hear you, but no, I think one of the brothers should. Any questions from the brother's side? No, I'm, go ahead. Again, let's keep the questions pertaining to the topic, inshallah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as uh, As for what you just said about like the uh, pamphlets and uh, things, is there is there a way we could also get them online so we could share amongst our families if we don't have the physical for what the uh, no, check? Inshallah, we'll, we'll pass it out on the PJMA uh, WhatsApp groups. Uh, we'll pass it on, inshallah, the inshallah. soft copy. Any other questions? <coughs> Anything from the sister's side? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The question I have, what advice can you give to some of the Muslim due to uh, not taking the religion seriously or lack of understanding who downplay this type of uh, celebration? And even like sometimes some of them will hang uh, things like this and people will come trick or treat and then they will open the door and give the candy. So what advice can you give to some of our brothers and sisters who are affected by this? Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless you sister. As uh, Dr. Farooq said, the, the, this practice of trick and treating and this festival has a rooted uh, festival that is connected to polytheism and seeking assistance in the demons and asking them for help. This is all, as we know, something that goes against Islam. It's best that Muslims, you leave this practice off. For the ones who do this in ignorance, then it's upon them to seek knowledge. There are some Muslims who are not aware of it. That's why we're here today, to learn about the background of what this festival is about. So it's best that we stay away from it. Nami, he'll ask some more things. Barakallahu feek, sister. I just wanted to answer the second half of your question, the end part. You said, mentioned about uh, people may come to your door and passing out, you know, candy, or you may feel obliged to passing out candy. Um, you know, just a reminder of one point that I mentioned in the khutbah today that I always like to remind my brothers and sisters with is our obligation in the United States to share Islam with our neighbors. Convey upon me, even if it is one verse. And what is a better statement or who is a better person who invites to Allah Azza wa Jal and does righteous good deeds and then is proud of his Muslim identity saying, indeed I am from amongst the Muslims. No one better from the best actions of ibadah, of worship of Allah Azza wa Jal is giving da'wah, sharing Islam with your Muslim neighbors, 
your non-Muslim neighbors, your non-Muslim co-workers, your non-Muslim students, your non-Muslim teachers, your non-Muslim passengers in the back of your Uber or Lyft or whatever you're driving or put one in the DoorDash bag. And Brother, we have so many opportunities to give now. And that is what I think we are missing in many of our communities. America is fertile land to give down. Many times when I talk with people, the only thing that's stopping them from accepting Islam is you saying, how are you today? I'm Muslim. Have you ever heard about Islam? And they're waiting. No, I never did. And you explain it to them many times. They'll, 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 they're waiting for the invitation. Come and be Muslim with me. Would you like to take Shahada? So my advice, sister, would be if you know that they're going to come to your house already and knock on your door, have some beneficial dawah pamphlets to give them. They knock on your door, trick or treat. I'm sorry, we're Muslim, we don't participate in Halloween, but here is a pamphlet about who we worship and why we don't practice this Halloween. And it's subhanAllah. You know that many of the early Christians, many of the Christians who lived in America when the Celtic people right, came from Ireland and they brought the, these, these paganistic practices with them from Ireland to the United States. Many Christians who were in America, they denied it. They, didn't, they rejected it completely. So there are many even Christians today that, you know, will agree with our stance on Halloween as well. That they know it's worship of and glorifying of shaitan and shayateen and demons and demonic principles and beliefs and things like this. So what I would say, sister, if they come to your door, give them Islam. Don't give them candy. Don't give them candied apples or popcorn balls and things like this. Give them, huh, here is a pamphlet. Who is Allah Azza wa What is Islam? Maybe they come back in a couple of days and they accept Islam. If that one, let's say 50 people come to your door and alhamdulillah you give everybody a pamphlet. What is Islam? Who is Allah? And two people come back and they take shahada. They come to the masjid. Alhamdulillah. Every single prayer, every single wudu, every That's the hisab. That's part of the sadaqa jariya that we want to have like Imam Abu Yahya mentioned in the beginning about supporting the community. So that's what I would, that's what we have found to be beneficial sister to do um, during these days, these weeks, especially sending information to the kids in school because if your kids go to public school where I'm at, we don't have an Islamic school. We have some homeschooling programs and things like this. You guys are more fortunate here to have Muslim schools here, Al Huda, and then here, Alhamdulillah, PJ May. And it's upon you guys to support these schools as much as you can. But up where I am, many of the Muslim kids, they go to public school. So you know the whole month of October, they decorate the schools, pumpkins and scarecrows and witches and spider webs and jack-o'-lanterns and every day and the, you know, next week it will be, one day will be dress up as a scarecrow, the next day dress up as a pumpkin, next day dress up as a witch, next day dress up as this and that. So it's even being pushed upon our kids. And everywhere we go, go to all the stores, go to Walmart, go to restaurants. Now they pumpkin spice lattes. Right? With the jack o' lantern. We, we're just in a hotel right now. SubhanAllah. The hotel that I'm staying in, you go in the lobby, it's got a black crow right, right on the. A black crow, right? What else? It had like a, a pumpkin in the corner. So a lot of these, you know, a lot of our non Muslim neighbors, they just do it out of customs. They don't understand the science behind it. They don't understand where it came from, the history of it. And how many times we just do things, right, out of habit or out of customs. Many of us even, may Allah protect us and aid us and increase us in knowledge. Some of us, right, We just practice the Islam that we saw our grandfathers and forefathers upon. We're not practicing it based upon conviction. And I'm convinced that this is the haqq. I'm convinced that Islam is the only way, the best way. I lived the days of Jahiliyyah. I was a non-Muslim at one time. And I'll tell you this, there's nothing in that lifestyle at all. 
So all of our Muslim youth who may, you know, oh, Islam is restricting, it's boring, I can't do this, that. The other lifestyle, you're going to lose your life or lose your soul or be in prison for the rest of your life or be misguided and following the footsteps of shaitan. So stay around these types of gatherings. Make this a regular event for you, a family event. Come out on Friday night, benefit from the imam, benefit from the activities here, support the community, support the imam. Inshallah, you see that things will grow, right? Have alternative solutions for, for example, you know that you know maybe a lot of the community members, you know, they're not, they're, they're striving to be at a level where they can you know, not participate in Halloween. All right, what are the alternatives that the community has to offer? Right? To, you know, nasud al furaj you know? To, to close that gap. Okay, what can we do? Right? Let's have a jeopardy night here. Islamic jeopardy. Come, instead of going out, letting your kids go out on Halloween night, let's bring them all here. We're going to do Islamic jeopardy and prizes and games and things like that. Alhamdulillah. We'll use that night for khair. And ibadat Allah and ataqarrab ila Allah instead of ataqarrab ila shayateen wa shaytan wa jinn. May Allah bless all of you. Jazakum Allah khair. We'll take one or two before we end the mashallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. I just want to ask two questions. Is there ayah you can read to protect the jinn from your house? And also, when you see a snake, can you put a poison around the yard or just kill it? Now, as for the, the houses, the Prophet وسلم, informed us that the Shia think they run away from houses in which Surah Al Baqarah is read. So if you read Quran in your house and you make the salawat in your house, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم خبورة Don't make your houses like graveyards. So pray the sunnah prayers. Listen to the Quran. Play the adhan. So shayatim will run away from the houses that there is Quran in it. But if we are in a state of ghafla and we're not aware what's going on, and the shayatim indicate the shaytan كان ضعيفة. The shaytan is, is weak. When it comes to mentioning Allah's name, shayatim can do anything for you. So we Muslims, we have this taboo in which we're so scared. We're scared of spirits, we're scared of shayatim, we're scared of demons. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ Allah says, وَقَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't be fearful of them, but rather be fearful of me. So we have to have knowledge. Everything starts with knowledge. So you want shayatim to run away from your house? Read Qur'an in your house. Have a Qur'an halakah with your family. Even if you're doing some things or you're doing work or you're running some air in the house, play the Qur'an. Play the Qur'an in your houses. It'll bring sakina for you. Any other questions? Brother, go ahead. Oh, about the snake, the poisonous snake. I wouldn't recommend putting poison around your house because your children may, you know, step into the poison, but I would, I would call the right authorities to remove the snake from your house, inshallah. Just uh, for more clarification, uh, you said um, that uh, the genes, we have uh, both the believers and the non-believers. So is it okay, is it permissible for the Muslim uh, man to interact with the Muslim jinn? Is that acceptable? The, the, the good question, mashallah. The, the, the rule of thumb is that if the jinn is a Muslim, they will not interfere in your life. That's the rule of thumb. Any jinn that in, interferes in your life, they're from the shayati. So sometimes the jinn will tell you, I'm a, I'm a Muslim jinn, I need your help. If you're a Muslim jinn, you're not supposed to interact with me aslim. That is the asal of the position. And all of this, especially where we come from, there's a lot of theories, a lot of stories. أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ مَا أَنزَلُ اللَّهَ بِهَا مِنْ سُلْطَانِ So, عَلَيْكَ يَا مُسْلِمْ 
upon you is to read the Quran, make dua. If the best of mankind, Al Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would never forget making the dua before he sleeps, reading Ayatul Kursi, before he sleeps, we are all in need in protection of Allah. We need the protection from Allah. So you do your best, then you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the rule of thumb is that if a jinn is a Muslim, he would not interact with you. She would not interact with you. That's the rule of thumb. Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah shaykh. Wa alaikum wa Maybe pass the bikes to the brother inshallah. One of the sisters, uh, she has a question and she wants me to ask on her behalf. The question she has is not related to the lecture tonight, but she wanted clarification, inshallah. Um, she wanted uh, okay, so we, we talked already, right? We said if it's not related to the talk, ask outside or set up a meeting with the imam. Inshallah, we said that already, right? We're talking about jinn and shayateen. If you ask me about some مسألة uh, الفقية عند المالكية like, like that, then I will not answer it. Okay? So inshallah, I think outside for the since we we already clarified it. Did I say this before? Alhamdulillah. So if it's not non-related topic, then we cannot address it. Inshallah. But you can always you know have make an appointment with me. Inshallah, or send the question in to the imam or outside. We could talk. Inshallah. Any other questions, brother? Go ahead. Zakhullah khairan. Alhamdulillah. Uh, clarify or this or uh, correct it that just a pumpkin in and of itself having a pumpkin in and of itself buying a pumpkin in and of itself is not wrong but if you do it in celebration of Halloween the jack-o-lantern that's another story the, the second well it's not of course because some people it will I've, I've had this experience um, children say and they're scared to touch it and won't want to get it and sometimes example they do field trips now because it's hard you know so I just wanted to mention that okay. uh, the question is what would you say is a what would you say is a to that Halloween done in the heart of the Muslim. Look at that, then how are you gonna tell me it's haram if those people are doing it? So was that three or four questions? No, that was a question. That was, that was the real question. <laughs> so, <laughs> we can maybe turn that up. Where's Brother Safir? Okay, the, the, the real question, brother. The first was a statement and just asking if you would, if you supported that, yes. then that was regarding the pumpkin. And as far as the real question was, what would you say is a good response to those who would point to the fact that Muslims are celebrating these practices like Halloween in the Muslim world, and they may use that to say, well, look, you know, you're telling me one thing and I see those Muslims doing that. Assalamu alaikum. Barakallahu feek, akhi. Excellent question. So the brother, he brought up a wonderful point. Alhamdulillah, maybe um, it needed to be clarified more um, when explaining Halloween and pumpkins and things like that. So pumpkins in themselves, alhamdulillah, this is something that the Prophet Muhammad Sassam actually used to love eating. Qara. Okay, as they call it, pumpkins or gourds and things like this. The Prophet Muhammad Sassam would love to eat. But when the pumpkin is changed or carved into a jack-o'-lantern with a candle in it and there's some type of itiqad behind it that you know we're celebrating or recognizing Halloween or we want to you know uh, follow the story of Jack O'Lantern right and his myth and what is behind that and the beliefs behind it then there's two different things, okay? So the pumpkin in itself is something that, you know, is permissible to use, to have in your house, to eat, whatever you want to do, go to the pumpkin patch and things like that, right? But using it as a jack-o'-lantern 
and having a belief or itiqad behind it that it is related to Halloween or you're celebrating that holiday, then we would say in that way it would not be permissible to use in Allah knows best. Then the second uh, question that the brother mentioned, may Allah bless him, was about what is the advice that we would give to maybe the Muslim nations that are participating in Halloween and those who may be influenced by looking and observing those Muslim countries participate in Halloween activities. What would we say to them? What would we advise them with? Because they'll come along and they'll say, well, hey, you know, this country is celebrating Halloween. They're wearing costumes. They're running around trick-or-treating and things like this. And that's a Muslim country. But now you're telling us that Halloween is haram. So, I mean, we have a principle in Islam, right, that al-amal nas la ala jawazihi, right? That just because you see a large group of Muslims doing something is not a proof of its permissibility. So you may have a large group of Muslims, may Allah protect us all and you know, those who may be addicted to things and things like that. We have, unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters who smoke cigarettes, right? Or hookah. Allah right? So would we come along and say, well, you know, all those brothers in this Muslim country or that Muslim country you smoke hookah and smoke cigarettes and things like this, so that means it's permissible and it's, or it's makru and it's not haram? Of course not, no. We would respond back to them what Allah says in the Quran. Wala tulku bi aidiyakum ila Do not destroy yourself or bring about your own destruction through your own hands. So similarly with that topic as well. If we saw some Muslim countries participating in Halloween and things like this, first of all, from the aqidah and the way of our righteous predecessors, is that we should make dua first and foremost in supplication for the leaders of those countries. That's first and foremost. Right? And if we have the ability to advise those who are in control, right, of those situations, those people, and things like that. So we offer our advice. But it doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye on it or we should not try to create a greater fitna from it. Okay? And we call it as it is, right? What do they say? They call, a spade is a spade. Right? A spade is a spade, no matter who does it. Whether they do it in Egypt, or they do it in Algeria, or they do it in Somalia, or they do it in Saudi Arabia, or they do it in America. Right? Our, our calling is one. Right? We deem all of these types of acts, dressing up in costumes and celebrating, right? looking like witches and demons and ghouls and ghosts and things like this is all shaitanic practices and activities and we do inkar of it. But the way that we make inkar of it is based upon our ability. Right? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi says مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرُهُ بِيَدِهِ فَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَتَعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَتَعْ he says, For those of you who see something denounceable, then denounce it with your hands. Right? That's if you have the authority. I don't have the authority to go to, you know, uh, Ghana or Egypt or Saudi Arabia and start changing laws and, you know, breaking things and stuff like that. No, that's haram actually. Right? Sometimes I, I won't even have the ability to speak out about it. Maybe I can write an article about it or do a post online and stuff like this, but to actually go and stand up, hey, what you guys are doing, maybe they'll put me in, put me in prison or torture me. and things. So you have to weigh out the benefits and the harms of the situation, right? Is it going to lead to a bigger maslaha or is it going to be a bigger mafsada? So that's very important. You weigh out the benefits and the harms. But at least try to do it, you, you, you know, you hate to see it. You hate to see your brothers and sisters of faith and those who, you know, call to Tawheed and Sunnah and things like this participating in these types of activities. So at least try to hate it and dislike it in your heart. Because if you don't dislike it and hate it in your heart, then your Iman is, that's it. Khalas. You got barely anything left. You're on 1%. Ready to die now like your phone, right? You better get a recharge. 
So we make dua for them, may Allah aid them. Right? And it's sad that we see this being practiced in many of the Muslim countries throughout the world. And you know, a lot of these things are out of our hands, but uh, we try our best, you know, first and foremost, make dua for our brothers and you know, just uh, just just situation. I mean, don't get me started. Alhamdulillah. I mean, you know, the situation within the ummah is you know not uh, you know not the way we want it to be now. But it's all from the hikmah and the wisdom and the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? And alhamdulillah, we always have a tafaul, right? We should always be optimistic for the future. Okay. Uh, just one example, may Allah aid our, can we make a dua? May Allah aid our brothers in Gaza. Alhamdulillah. May Allah aid our brothers in Yemen. May Allah aid our brothers in Sudan. May Allah aid our brothers in Sudan. May Allah aid our brothers in Sudan. The reason why I'm making dua for our brothers in Sudan three times is so that we can increase our awareness about what's going on in Sudan. The media is covering everything that's going on in Palestine and they're going through a lot. I know, alhamdulillah. May Allah aid them, may Allah help them, may Allah remove their oppressors. But the media isn't saying one thing about what's going on with our brothers and sisters in Sudan. At the hands of other Muslims, in the hands of the same people who are killing our brothers in Palestine. So we make dua for them. And the most important time to make dua is in our sujood. Don't think that just because Imam Abu Yahya or I didn't make dua for them that we don't care about them or we don't, you know, we're not. Alhamdulillah, a Muslim kajasad in wahid. Yidha shtaka minhu udwun, tada'a lahu sa'ir al-jasadi bi sahri wa humma, kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Muslims are like one body. If one limb is suffering, illness or sick, then the whole body suffers. Yes, of course we're suffering from seeing our brothers and sisters being killed in Yemen, in Palestine, in Sudan and Syria, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, then the list goes on and on and on and on. But what can we do? I mean, some of us, how that we have the ability to do, to go. Some of us have ability to send money. Some of us only have the ability to do dua. So at least we should do is do dua. And focus on those times when your dua is mustajab. Last third of the night. Maybe your dua and the last third of the night is better than sending $10,000 Maybe your dua that you make in Salatul Fajr in the Jama'ah, in the Masjid, is better than going in person. So dua is silah al The dua is the weapon of the believer. What connects the hearts with the believers here, over there. So may Allah aid us. May Allah aid the Muslim countries. I mean, and, uh, two more, okay. Two more, we gotta wrap it up, inshallah. Just Barakallah. brief answer. Like, uh, the question I had was related to mental health. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the jinn, and you mentioned some, some uh, mental health illnesses. Uh, I understand right now in uh, many circles, uh, our imams, our scholars, they're on one end of the spectrum, and our mental health, if you will, professionals are on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, have there, to your knowledge, any effort been made to kind of bridge that gap, especially in the Muslim, from the Muslim perspective, is one question. The second question is, do you have any specific, <laughs> specific references, inshallah, that you can refer, inshallah, Muslims to who, uh, who, who really want uh, to uh, go see somebody about mental health, inshallah. Naam Barak In general, all of the illnesses, the Quran is a shifa for it. The ahadith, the supplication, the dua that the Prophet taught us is a shifa for it. In terms of the specifics, I think what the Sheikh mentioned is that there could be cases in which it could be related to jinn possession. He didn't say all mental health is related to jinn. There could be cases, but this has to be viewed and looked at per case scenario, per case basis in which that they should go to a raqi, uh, a person who knows Quran and who's qualified. Likewise, uh, a medical uh, doctor who specializes in that field as well. What's your second question? Hello. 
Naam, so Islam, we have Rukhya. Al-Rakhi is the one who makes supplication, reads the Quran and the Dua on the one who's sick. Uh, no, currently we don't have, we don't support those services. <laughs> no. Uh, just my quick question is about how to different. Can I add? Let me add something, brother. I'm sorry to cut you off. So, Buhaira, mashallah, jazakallah khair. Excellent question. So, um, the best resource that you have is like the brother mentioned, the Quran. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you a story, firsthand story, in Mecca. Okay. Every year I would work with the Wazarat al Hajj. Okay, the Ministry of Hajj as a translator for many of the shaykh. There was one shaykh, may Allah preserve him and increase him in goodness, um, who was known to do ruqya upon people. People would come to him from all over the world, Indonesia, Turkey, Malaysia, Africa, um, all over, right? They would come, sometimes they would come just for him. Like their intention, instead of making hajj, I'm going to get ruqya from him, then going to make hajj. So, many years, he would, you know, yastaqbal, uh, he would, you know, host and, uh, you know, receive all of these people coming for ruqya, to read upon them and things like this. And then the last year that I made hajj with them, I think it was probably in 20, I don't know, 13 maybe. And I was in his office and people were coming to his door and he was like, tell them that no, I'm not doing it anymore. Everybody who would come looking to get ruqya, he would say, no, tell them I'm not doing it anymore. And I was like, Sheikh, what's wrong? Every year you're like, you, you do ruqya to them. He's like, look, Farooq. He's like, look, I've realized that over the past couple of years, now it's just turned into a business. People are taking advantage of other people, just taking their money. And another thing why I don't want to do it is because the people attach their shifa to the raqi, to the one reciting, and think that the cure is coming from this particular shaykh instead of the cure coming from Allah Azza wa Jal and the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he said, this is what I do now. He says, now I teach them how to do ruqya upon themselves. Like the shaykh mentioned, Al-Fatiha is ruqya. We know the famous hadith that came in Bukhari and Muslim, right? About the companions who were traveling and they came across some Bedouins in the desert and one of the chief of the Bedouins was sick. They say in some narrations he was either crazy or he was bit by a scorpion or a snake. So they asked the companions, do you have anything to cure him? And one of the companions, he says, yes, I have something. He read Surah Al-Fatiha to him and he was cured. Then they went back to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he gave him like a herd of his sheep, I think, right? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "What made you know that it was ruqya?" So reading Fatiha, okay, that's what you should do. We do that at least 17 times a day. Ayatul Kursi, the last three surahs of the Quran, other verses in the Quran, right? The supplications of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, taking care of your personal hygiene. Right? Uh, Imam al Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, in his jami', he mentions uh, a hadith, which there is some weakness in it, that the majority of the waswasa that people have, the majority of the whisperings of shaitan that people have from wudu and things like this, they're from not cleansing oneself in the bathroom. Where did we say that jinn like to hang out? in the places of answering the call of nature, right? Defecation and urination and things like this. So not cleansing yourself properly after you use the bathroom, not knowing how to do istinja, and for our sisters, not cleansing yourself properly after you have your monthly cycle and things like this, this is leaving you more susceptible to being affected by waswasa, but not only waswasa, it could be, right, jinn as well. So paying attention to personal hygiene, entering the du'as that you say, right, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi wa khaba'at, when you come out, ghufranaka, okay, paying attention to those supplications, not thinking that, oh, you know, they're, you know, insignificant or they don't matter. No, they do matter. Try it. Try it for a week. Try it for a month. See the difference. 
in your focus in the wudu, your focus in the prayer, your focus in sujood and different aspects of the prayer. Now, and I think, um, I don't know about this in particular, this book, but I think, um, I know Dr. Bilal Phillips, his PhD, I think, was about the jinn, about the jinn. But I haven't seen anybody compile a book which is related to what you mentioned about how to recognize if somebody is possessed by a demon or is it really a mental illness that someone has. And I think that mental health professionals and imams need to sit down, knock it out, because I'm sure there's a lot of Muslim psychologists and psychiatrists and you know who studied psychology and mental disorders, they, they need to sit down because if they're solely basing their diagnosis on just, you know, secular knowledge and knowledge of what they see and not the unseen, then that's deficient. And then same thing from the other side, right? If the Muslims are only using, right, based on the unseen and they're diagnosing everybody, no, it's a jinn, it's a jinn, it's a jinn. No, that's incorrect as well because some cases could be, you know, really based on nerves or um, muscular uh, deficiencies or you know vitamin and mineral deficiencies that's causing them to have these problems and things like this so they need to blend between the two but they need to be well versed in the two and Allah knows best Jazakumullah khairan we'll end over here may Allah bless Dr. Farooq Post for his time and efforts may Allah place in his hasanat of good deeds may Allah protect him and his family and his community we also ask Allah to reward all the brothers and sisters that stayed here. I know the time is very late, but you came to benefit. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. Subhanakum wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubalaik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.